Well, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, sorry if I, I stay seated because I have some pain here, and if I move, I, I don't feel very well. So I hope to stand for the whole class, but seated here. So my name is Alisa Sayrol, and as with the, like the other professors, I'm, I'm one of the teachers of this course. And I will be here uh, today and next week teaching two, two classes. And then uh, for the rest of the course, I'm, of course, I'm, I'm available. And, and I, I'm responsible for the exams, as Xavi mentioned last day. OK? Uh, well, uh, I've been working for a while, uh, some of part-time, let's say, in neural networks, in deep learning. And uh, I have collaborated with, uh, with Xavi, doing some saliency applications. Uh, also with Ramon Morros, that he is also a professor in this course. Uh, we've been working on, on face recognition, and now uh, we are working on improving these systems by using uh, incremental learning. And also with Veronica, we are doing some um, biological application to deep learning, to some cell, cell and detection, OK? Uh, I also say that uh, as this, the, the slides that I'm using are part of or are mine, but also I use from the other courses that we've been teaching, the seminars or uh, workshops uh, that are uh, done around by, by Kevin, that as Xavi mentioned the other day, he collaborates uh, with us in other courses, and, and also Antonio Bonafonte and, and Santi Pascual that uh, are also teaching courses, but uh, apply it to speech and language, and myself I'm more uh, devoted to applications in computer vision. But anyway, the class of today is a general class that, I mean, it doesn't depend if it's applied to vision or, or speech and language or other applications. And it's a, like a continuation of what Xavi mentioned, or what Xavi explained it last week. So he started with, uh, with the perception that's a, a unit that what uh, this unit makes is to combine the inputs, the input uh, uh, X, through some weights and some bias. And then this goes through an activation function that, as Chavi explained last week, for the case of linear regression, this activation function is the identity. So the goal is, let's say, to, to estimate these parameters, W, and to find the best, uh, 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 let's say, what, what will approximate or what will give better estimated for some mix, uh, getting some output that it's not far from what the examples uh, provide. Uh, the other problem was for classification. And he showed one example of that one perception can also do a, a linear classification. And in this case, the activation function that he showed it was a sigmoid, which is given by this expression. And in a way, this function will see more activation function, but goes slowly from 0 uh, to 1. He also explained it, the case uh, of the, the softmax, which is the operator uh, that we use uh, when we want to classify, I mean, we want a multi-class, uh, when we are in a multi-class uh, problem, as the means case that we saw and that we will see here again, OK? So uh, the last slide that uh, Xavi showed was this uh, case of having to take a decision when your problem is not linear, and you have to divide in this case, in this example, you have two classes, but the division of these two classes won't be a line, but one would be some weird region here that cannot be solved uh, with, a, with a linear regressor, or in this case, with a, uh, 
with the case that we've seen here, the binary classification, okay? Uh, with the logistic regression. Uh, okay, so in real world we have a lot of, uh, I mean most of the cases that you are going to see in this course, uh, like we, when we have data that belong, uh, that, that are images, videos, audio text, that you have a classification problem, but this is not linear. So what can we do in these cases? What, what are the possible solutions? So, uh, okay, I, would, I could say we can use deep learning, but there are some other solutions, so let's mention them. Uh, one of them would be to use uh, nonlinear classifiers. The, the most typical one are decision trees or uh, Kanier's neighbors. So if you have taken machine learning courses, you, will, you know how this works. It's, and it, it's a way to do this, uh, to build these nonlinear classifiers. You also could uh, work on, on features of your data that uh, are linearly separable. So instead of using uh, some feature of the data per se that is not linear, change to a feature space uh, that, that be becomes linear. And then use a linear model, of course. Uh, you can also uh, use kernels, engineered kernels, that are similarity measures. For example, the super vector machines. And uh, the last option that we mentioned here are the uh, find a suitable representation of your space of the data. And this is the case uh, for deep learning. And this is what uh, we could classify deep learning as one technique that what does is to change the representation of the data so you can do uh, this classification. There are other, uh, other classifiers, like the Viola and Jones, if you know uh, about, uh, for example, face detection. Uh, this uh, Viola and Jones uh, classifier is used to detect uh, faces, and it's also, uh, uh, let's say, uh, a, a procedure that works in, in another uh, representation of, of the space. So let's, let's see one example that uh, shows that really, uh, one very simple example that shows how we need uh, to use the learning to, to solve a problem. And this problem, it's a typical one, which is the exclusive OR. And we start by, by seeing that uh, the operations like AND and OR can be uh, generated uh, with a single perception a single perceptron. And this can be seen with, uh, with, this, uh, with this space, when you see that uh, the output of AN, when you have to, your input is 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, and 1, 1, 1, okay? And as you can see, this is a, a linear pr problem because you can find uh, this, let's say, to classify this space in two parts. And you can do it with a perceptron such as this one, which has a, a weight of two for x1 or x2, and a bias of minus three. Eh? You can compute that, and you will see if we have two zeros, the sum here would be minus three. Your activation function, uh, let's say, uh, it's zero when your number is negative, and one when your output here is positive. So here you will have minus three, that's negative, your output is zero. Uh, in one, one of these two cases, if you have a zero or one, you have a two minus three in the first case or two minus three in the second case, same thing. The result is minus one, it's a negative number, your activation function would give a zero. And finally, if both are one, you see one by two plus one by two, four minus three, this is one, this is positive and the output is one. So very simple uh, perceptron uh, to compute the, the, this function, which is the AND operation, okay? You can write down analytically this function like this, where your activation function, uh, I would, 
I put it the step function which says when this is negative is zero and this is positive <coughs> it's one okay and the same thing for for the R function now your your threshold your linear separation of classes is here in this case you have a zero when the two inputs are zero one when it's zero one one when it's one zero and one one output one okay you know you all know the or function and also it's very easy to solve this uh, with this uh, perception the same uh, way to find the output you will see we have if two if the two x1 or x2 are zero output minus one if one of the two uh, is one we have two minus one one positive then output one and in the last case, uh, four minus one, three, positive, the output is one. Okay, this is very simple with one perception for the uh, and or or, you can solve this problem. But let's, let's, find, let's try to find one perception which does this operation, which is the exclusive or, that is zero when both inputs are zero or one, and it's one, uh, when you have one of each, zero, one, one, zero, okay? So there is no way you can try to, to, to build one perceptron such as this, try to find weights, try to find a bias, no way you are going to uh, solve this exclusive R. But we can do something to solve it. And this where we will come the multi-layer perceptron. We can do we can divide the problem in several steps. The first steps will say, okay, let me generate one perception that gives me a one when I have one zero, okay? And, well, well I mean, when uh, x1 is zero and x2 is one, okay? When we have zero, one, you will see that zero one will give you two minus one, one positive. Any other answer uh, that is zero zero, uh, I mean here one zero or one one will give you a negative value so you are generating this function. And I will generate another perception that does this operation that is to get a one when uh, I mean, it's kind of the opposite of this one. Eh? When you have here only, you will have a one when x1 is one and x2 is zero, okay? Same procedure, very, very similar uh, perception, except we have changing the weights for x1 and x2. These are the equations, but we can generate the uh, exclusive R taking these two outputs and saying, okay, I know that uh, whenever I have two zeros or two ones here, uh, well, it's, that's not, uh, whenever, it, it not, it's not the input, but the output of H1 and H2, you will see that give me a, a zero uh, here, okay? Um, so you have to see the output of H1 and H2, that is uh, when you have zero, zero here, or, or one, one here, you always get, you will get H1, H2 zeros, either for zero, zero or one, one, and then of course this is negative, and, and you get a zero, okay? So the, both inputs get into this point. And when you have uh, in the previous x1, x0, 1, 0, or 0, 1, you are here and you will have a, an, a positive number and of course uh, these two numbers get a 1. So you, we have gone from a space x2, x1 in here to one space which is h2 and h1. Uh, the, the points 0, 0, 1, 1 uh, in h2, h1 are here so you can do this linear separation by using H1 and H2, okay? So you have, you in a way, what you need is like a, a multi-layer perceptron when you have, where you have the 
input layer with the two values. From here you have generated H1 and, H and H2. And from these two you have generated the output. So you have input layer, output layer, and in between whatever you have is a hidden layer. Okay? And this is the way to, to build your uh, exclusive OR. Um, just for notation, well, here you have the equations, but just for notation, when, when you see several uh, multilayer perceptions with several layers, you will always see uh, how many neurons you have in each of the layers. And for example, here you have uh, your input uh, have two, two values, so that's a two. Your hidden layer here has also gives two values, a two, and the output, in this case it's binary, you have a one, okay? Also that uh, every one of these neurons, this is very simple, but just to start seeing the, the concepts, you ha this, every one of these neurons gets inputs from, from the previous layer, from the inputs, all of them go to this, this neuron. And for the other neuron, the same thing. So this is called fully connected topology. We'll see more examples next. Uh, but when all neurons from one layer connect to the previous layer from all the neurons below, give input through there, it's called uh, fully connected, okay? Uh, here, I mean, with this idea, we have, um, we have find uh, the solution to a nonlinear problem, very simple, which is the exclusive OR, but we can go to more complex regions, okay? And this is one example that you have in, in, in we'll now enter to this website for, from the University of Texas, where uh, your region of interest is the inner part of a star. And if you go there, you can play a little bit and see, okay, this is a multilayer perception and, and you want to classify dots inside the star or outside the star. So here you can play and so you will see that when you mark one dot that is inside the star, you get a one and it's outside, you get a zero, okay? Well, you can play, but the interesting, interesting thing of this uh, region is to see uh, how is your uh, multilayer perception. And here, uh, this is the, the multilayer perception that gives uh, the, the solution to, to classify pixels within the star or without, uh, outside the star, okay? And, uh, well, here you don't, still we didn't talk about training, but you have the weights of these, uh, of these uh, five, five uh, neurons in this hidden layer. And uh, here you have the, the values of, of the weights for here and, and the bias weights, okay? And uh, here you have ones for all the, to get the, the P5. Okay, so, oh, no, no, sorry, the, the, the weights of, of each one of these branches is in here, and it's each one of these, of these weights, and a bias minus two. So, I mean, this is handcrafted, and uh, it's not easy to get these values. You will have to train. We'll see later on how to train them. But this is a, a also another example of multilayer perception, okay? Um, so you see the idea uh, with these two examples, why with this hidden uh, layer we can build these nonlinear uh, boundaries for classification. Let's go back to, to the presentation, okay? And just to, to just to put a, let's say, a general uh, diagram of uh, a multilayer perception with only one hidden layer. As I mentioned, this would be uh, uh, a multilayer perception with one hidden layer. With You will see that input of this neuron, uh, you have inputs from all, all the input values in the input layer. Eh? It's a fully connected layer. Um, and as 
we saw uh, and we have seen today, we, every neuron has this linear combination of I inputs and an uh, activation function. Mm -hmm. well, obviously, the, always the output is the target variable, the, the regression uh, function or the classification function. Uh, here's another example of uh, two hidden layers. Let's say that uh, at the end you're going to use uh, a notation uh, where you will say, uh, I mean, that is general uh, with as many hidden layers as you have. So uh, the first uh, layer is always the, the input layer, but you call this H0, and H0 is equal to, to the input X, okay? Any of the hidden layers after this uh, first layer, uh, you, 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 you symbolize it by the number of the hidden layer, okay? And for, let's say, if we have more than two layers, we will call that H of T, that is the T hidden layer. It has its, uh, it takes the inputs from the previous layer, uh, multiply it by the, the corresponding weights, and you add also the bias. Huh? So you have weights of these uh, hidden layers, symbolized by T, that depend on the inputs of the previous layer, the previous hidden layer. And the final layer, it's called, well, it's when you have finished, the, the, the last one, it's the F of X, which is the output, okay? Also for notation, um, let's say that when we have multiple hidden layers, we call that the depth of, of your multilayer perception of, of your, of your uh, deep network. And uh, usually also when you count how many neurons you have within a layer, that's the width, okay? If you see these two ways to call uh, these two parameters, you, you know what's about, okay? Uh, as you will see in the examples, when you go through convolutional neural networks, you would see in, in image classification, you may use uh, up to even uh, very high numbers, uh, as even 100, eh? when you will see the, the ResNet uh, network, uh, you will see that you, you may have uh, lots and lots of, of, of hidden layers. Okay, uh, so far uh, we have talked about sigmoid, but this is not the only activation function that you may have. Uh, one of the questions that you may pose to yourself is why do we need uh, activation functions? Why not do several layers with no activation? So like the identity that we were talking for the uh, regression, linear regression problem. But of course, uh, think of your courses of uh, linear systems, signals and systems courses. So you, you can divide a linear problem in several steps of linear problems. At the end, you will have uh, everything linear. So you won't introduce any nonlinearity and you won't be able to solve nonlinear problems, okay? So we need these nonlinear uh, function, these activation functions. Anyway, we need that these some properties, you will see through the course why we need, they, they, they have to be smooth continuous and differentiable. And besides sigmoid, you have uh, other functions like a hyperbolic tangent or a, a very typical one, which is the rectifier linear unit. This one is very used, which is linear for positive and zero for negative. And uh, you can also have uh, what is called leaky uh, rectifying linear union uh, unit where maybe you may have some some output even if your input is negative. Eh? We will use them through the course, but let me tell you that ReLU is is quite used. Okay. Uh, okay. I, I have tell you that uh, you will see some some uh, uh, examples later with a, a lot of hidden layers. But there is a, a universal approximate, uh, approximation theorem that states that uh, 
with a single hidden layer, you get you could build a, you could build a, mm, a continuous function, which say let's say to generate some nonlinear regions, only with a single hidden layer. Okay, but uh, then the question is why don't we use always uh, multi-layer perceptions with only one hidden layer? And the answer is that okay, this theorem says that there exists uh, the possibility to, to find this hidden layer, but uh, nobody say how easy or difficult it is to find this uh, this uh, neural net with, with only one hidden layer to find this uh, this nonlinear region. Okay, so it's not easy. It's not easy at all. You don't have uh, procedures, uh, ways to find this this uh, deep learning network with only one hidden layer, okay? And it might need an extremely large number of neurons to build this network. So in practice, uh, it, this approach is not used. What people does is to build uh, deep neural networks with more than one hidden layer, okay? Learning. So far, we have seen what is a forward pass of our, our multi-layer perception. That is, I know already the weights, or I hadn't crafted these weights to know the output, but I've never said how to estimate these, these weights. And we need to find ways to, to, to find these weights, okay? This is what we can call learning, and we can do it through, through training, but for that, we need to define what is that are called the loss functions, okay? So for example, for the problem of linear regression that we have seen previously, we know that the output is uh, this function, a, combina a linear combination of my input plus a bias, but how do I, if I, how do I estimate these weights, okay? So to estimate it, well, I need a, a criterion and a loss function, and I say, okay, what I will do is to try to minimize the square, fun the, the, the square function, what is called the Euclidean loss, okay? So I do the, the difference, the square difference of each one of these examples with this, and uh, I try to minimize this loss function. So these, these weights can give you the best approximation, okay? Also, in, in our logistic regression problem, the problem, uh, I mean, I use another loss function. The typical one is the cross entropy uh, function, which comes from the, the likelihood, meaning the log likelihood, uh, negative log likelihood, okay? So uh, what you will end up is to try to, to find the minimum of this uh, loss function, okay? And through finding this, uh, the minimum of this loss function, I'm going to compute these weights. For, let's go back now again to the a very easy problem that we can all understand is that the, the problem of minimizing this uh, uh, Euclidean function. So in order to minimize this, this, uh, this function, this difference, what we all know that we can do is to try to find this minimum by uh, trying to, to get the gradient in, let's say, we, we, our, our first estimation of the parameters are here, okay, and you compute the gradient, and you know that you can go down through this minimum through, uh, through uh, getting a better estimate through this, uh, through this gradient by, uh, by multiplying this gradient by some, uh, some value, which is calling the learning rate. So through this, uh, every time I'm approximating uh, the value, the loss function, the minimum of the loss function through its real minimum. Of course, this is a very, uh, mm, let's say, it's a way to see what we can do, but it's not easy, it's not always easy to find this, this local minimum, okay? Uh, just mention about this, uh, this learning rate that I, I have introduced here, and this will be one of our, what we call hyperparameters. So the parameters of the, of the network are these W and biases that we have uh, 
uh, talk about so far, but you will see little by little how uh, to define your to, to find your solution or your, your deep network, you, you will use another kind of parameters that are called hyperparameters. And the learning rate is one of them. Okay? So you know in this uh, very easy problem that if uh, your uh, learning parameter is too large, you, you can have overshoots to the local minimum. If it's too small, it, you progress very slowly. So you need to find a nice uh, a learning rate to little by little uh, go to your minimum loss, okay? Uh, as you will see, in, even if with our complex uh, networks that you will see through the course, what one thing that it's done usually is to start with a, with a high learning rate to do large steps at the beginning and we go when we evolve, uh, we, um, let's say, we decrease this learning rate. Uh, there is one term here which are epochs, which I will explain uh, right now. But uh, let's, let's generalize this simple example that we have seen with this uh, linear regression. Usually, the goal in any network is going to be to find these parameters that minimize uh, minimize these uh, these parameters. I mean, these are also the parameters that you are going to update. Uh, minimize this loss function that depends on on your on your true uh, result compared to what you have uh, right now in your several steps uh, estimate. Okay. Let's not forget that we are in supervised uh, uh, problems, learning. Uh, so when it's supervised, you have a set of examples that you know the output, the solution. Okay? You use these training examples to compute your parameters. And then with your test uh, examples, you're going to see if uh, your network performs well. Okay? Okay, to, to compute that, you may, uh, I mean, in general, there are no clause form solutions. Um, and the basic idea, as in the previous example, is to use uh, gradient descent algorithms to find the optimal solution to minimize this loss function, okay? Uh, uh, in general, these dependencies are very complex. Uh, and, and to find a global minimum is very difficult with these very deep uh, networks. Sometimes when you get to local minimum, the, the answer is good enough. Eh? Mm. So uh, just to mention that, it's, it's not easy, but well, we can get nice approximation and we also see that through the, through the courses. Also, when you start doing the, solving this problem, you have to initialize, initialize your parameters. And your, um, your solution will also depend on this first initialization, okay? We'll see little by little how this training works. Uh, also, with the gradient descent, as I mentioned, the idea is just to update your parameters with the parameters that, that you get in your previous uh, iteration, uh, taking into a account the gradient of your loss function multiplied by this learning rate, okay? Usually, uh, the, this uh, gradient here is not uh, easy to, to solve. You can find closed form solutions, but what you end up doing is doing, tr uh, getting an estimate of this gradient, and then we call it stochastic gradient descent. You can do it with uh, every one of the, your training samples that you have, or you can use a bunch, a batch, a bunch, of, uh, I mean a set of training examples that is called a mini batch to estimate this gradient. Okay. And this, uh, this is called well, stochastic gradient sense. And you have to define in your training the size of this 
batch. How many samples? Examples I take to estimate the gradient. Uh, also, you will, you will little by little I would say see more concepts, but you have the momentum, uh, which says, okay, in my previous tapes, my gradient was going into, into that direction. Uh, you may have some memory of the direction of this uh, gradient, okay? And this is called the momentum, how you take into account your previous estimation in your new iteration. In, in several weeks, you will also ha see that, okay, beside this stochastic gradient descent, there are other ways to update these weights. Eh? These are called optimizers, and you will have uh, an, a class where you will see these, these optimizers, okay? So I just tried to, to introduce some concepts for you to start getting familiar with, with them, with this training. And an important also uh, uh, thing that you have to know is the evolution of your loss function, okay? So as I, as I said, you have a train, uh, let's say a set, a data set, you are in supervising training, and what you do, and you know the answer to I mean, the solutions for, for, this, for a training set, that you're going to use to, to minimize this loss function. So every time that you use this training set, all, all your data of this training set, you, you iterate your exercise, you go, we will see next day the, the back propagation, how you, the way to, propag to estimate the weights for a large deep network. But let's say that you have iterations each time you have uh, new examples. But when you have processed all the example, this is called an epoch, okay? So uh, let's say you compute your loss for an epoch, for you have used all your training data. Some, you also use some part of your, your data to validate this loss. I mean, this validation set was not used to train your network. And you see how it, it behaves, okay? So let's say I pass all my data and I get for my first epoch a result of the loss. I check that with my validation loss that I have not used to train the data. Eh? And I do the same thing uh, again. I pass again all the data through my system, but of course my parameters have changed, okay? And little by little I see, that's a typical uh, curve for the loss, how this loss uh, goes down, okay? Um, and well, usually when you plot these, these loss functions for many epochs, you will see something like that, okay? That your training loss goes down, goes down, but maybe there is one point where you see that uh, your validation loss starts growing. So maybe the system says, okay, maybe it's best to train this system up to this epoch, okay? So this is the best model for this, for this network. So let's, let's keep this idea, okay? You will see more losses, more concepts behind this, uh, this training and monitoring of your training, but let's keep this idea. Um, but you, you, you have seen that the loss has uh, gone down little by little. You, we will see uh, also that besides using a loss function that we minimize, we sometimes compute other metrics that are very interesting and that give me a lot of information of what's going on, okay? And, uh, and we will see the difference between these metrics uh, and, and the loss function. Okay, you can, since I don't have more time, you can enter to these, uh, these websites that are from Kevin McGuinness and, and you can see here uh, how this gradient descent algorithm works for a linear regression problem and a logistic regression problem. Eh? Just very fast, but you can go little by little. And I would say, don't look at it, don't look it too much because you ha still have to learn how to, to program uh, neural networks, but you have here some of the parameters or concepts that we have talked here are already in this problem. You have a model, you have a loss function, the gradient, 
and some of the parameters. You enter here the epochs, and at the end, after the evolution of the loss, after 490 epochs, you'll see you minimize this loss, okay? And you can plot this regression line. I recommend you, you to look through it little by little, as well as for this log the logistic regression. Both are linear, but I think it's very nice to look at it to, to start seeing these training co concepts, okay? Let's finish with one example, which is the MNIS example. As you remember from the last day, the idea is that you have uh, an image uh, with some handwritten digits and you have to uh, classify these. You have 10 classes. To have, you have to know if this is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. That is uh, 10 classes. This data set has 60,000 examples to train and 10,000 uh, samples to test, okay? Your, uh, every one of these images is 28 by 28 grayscale image. That is 784 pixels. You can go through this website to see more details about this data set. But of course, the, the objective is that you give this uh, handwritten uh, image of a digit and you detect which is this digit. For us, it's very easy, but for a machine, uh, in principle, it's not that easy, okay? And the model that can, can solve this problem is this uh, multi-layer perception that has uh, four layers. That is the input layer that since our images are 28 by 28 has 784 inputs. Then you have two hidden layers. Each one of them have uh, 512 neurons. You see here this one and this one. It's fully connected that every one of these neurons is connected to all these inputs in this layer. Each neuron here is connected to the inputs from the previous uh, layer, okay? Uh, as activation functions, uh, we have a, a hyperbolic tangent. Uh, as, as I mentioned, one way to symbolize this could be uh, to put 512 hidden layer, 512 hidden layer, and 10 output layers. And uh, the activation function is uh, hyperbolic tangent, but in the last uh, layer, as we saw for multiple class classification, we use a softmax, okay? And as the loss function, the cross entropy loss function that I mentioned before. So uh, this, uh, this multi-layer perception is trained. Still, with, uh, we, I, I have seen that the basis for training are great in the sand. Still, we have to say a few things about it. But see that uh, this network has uh, more than 600,000 uh, parameters, okay? So for the first layer, you have this 784 by 512 for the weights and 512 for the bias. Connecting this layer with this layer, it's 512 by 512 plus 512 biases, okay? And the connection between this layer and this layer, it's 512 by 10 plus 10 biases. Uh, this gives this amount of weights that you have to compute. And uh, let's say that uh, one example of, of, of result uh, that one algorithm could, could give, it's okay, we have trained this, this network uh, for 40 epochs. We have gone through these 10,000 examples during, I mean, 40 times. Uh, we have used mini batch, I mean, in this example, a specific uh, uh, mini batch stochastic gradient descent. We define this hyperparameter that is the batch size of 128, a learning rate of 0.1, in this case, that alpha that I mentioned before, 0.1, and the training has taken five minutes, okay, in a, in a GPU. And what are the results? I, I don't have a value for the loss, but I have t 
told you about other metrics. And one metric that is very often used in classification problems is accuracy. And accuracy will give the, let's say, the number of, uh, of examples that, that are well, classification, well classified in the test <laughs> set divided by the total number of, uh, of examples. So here we had 188 errors among these 10,000. So let's say in the numerator, I put 10,000 minus 188 divided by 10,000. And this gives me, I multiply it by 100, 98.12% accuracy. That's nice, but you could see that uh, if you work a lot, a, a little bit more on this MNIST example, you can improve these results. For once, for some, maybe for a little bit, you can get a little bit closer to 100 accuracy. Okay? So, to finish, just to say that uh, we have talked about this learning. Still, we don't know how to, to train that, and we'll see uh, next day. But uh, when we have multiple layers, okay, this, this grading has to go uh, to estimate the parameter of each one of the hidden layers, the W eh, for layer K and the, the biases for layer K. And this can be done by using uh, uh, what is called the chain rule of differentiation. We will see that uh, how can we propagate backwards our gradients to estimate the parameters, okay? Uh, so next day we will see this uh, procedure uh, that uh, is used to, to estimate the, the parameters of a deep, deep layer, deep network, uh, by using this procedure that is called back propagation, okay? So we'll see an exa uh, several examples now today. I mean, some, some analytics and some examples with numbers of how to, to do this, how this back propagation works to estimate the parameter. And for today, that's it. I don't know if you have questions. Well, in any case, I don't know, I have, I have bored you a lot. <laughs> it's after lunch and it's tough to, to teach after lunch, but uh, I hope uh, you have understood the concepts. Otherwise, you can contact me and we can discuss if you have any problem any, any day or next, next day that I will explain you the backpropagation algorithm, okay?